Many of today's changes seem to be happening on the streets, but ultimately solutions will come at the negotiating table. Are there good, better, and best ways to negotiate? We'll talk about those issues next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Welcome to Global Perspectives. You can't always get what you want, or can you? Oh, you in here? From haggling over prices in a local market to pursuing an international treaty, a key talent that can make or break the outcome is the ability to negotiate. In today's competitive global society, negotiation skills are imperative and require cultivation and regular reassessment. One expert who understands the world of reaching agreements and settling disputes especially well is today's guest, Tim Cullen, the director of the Oxford Program on Negotiation at Oxford University. Along with some of the best negotiators, persuaders, and decision makers on the planet, Cullen shares the secrets of effective negotiation through interactive lectures and discussions, case studies, role-playing, and informal seminars. Welcome to the show, Mr. Cullen. Thank you, it's nice to be back. Now, you have spent uh, well over 30 years in all aspects of public and private sector negotiation, including with well-known institutions such as the World Bank. Tell us a little bit about what that's been like. Well, I must say I'm very fortunate. I have had quite a varied career. I um, work for Ford Motor Company. I work for a big bank, and I spent 21 years with the World Bank. And actually, in the 12 years since I left the World Bank, in addition to teaching negotiation, I've been involved in quite a lot of negotiations. And so I'm fortunate to have had a varied life. And that has, uh, and I think in the first part of it, I found myself negotiating um, uh, as I went along without really knowing how to do it properly. And then increasingly, I learned how to do it properly. I went and studied in various places to do it, did a lot of research. And eventually, uh, about a decade ago, I uh, was instrumental with a, with a colleague in creating the Oxford Program on Negotiation. Now, how has this program been received? Obviously, negotiation, as we said, is, is a key skill to have in all settings from the domestic to the international, but in today's increasingly competitive uh, interdependent world, it seems that that skill is more important than ever. It really is. Um, I mean, we've had literally hundreds of people go through the program. We do it twice a year, 30 to 40 people each time, many walks of life. We have ambassadors, we have CF CFOs, CEOs. But I've found a big demand um, beyond the core program we do in Oxford. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, I've been uh, twice already to teach at UCF, um, uh, business people from the Orlando area. Uh, but I've, uh, I go each year to Vietnam. I teach the uh, uh, young diplomats in the Vietnamese foreign ministry how to negotiate. Um, I, last year and the year before, I went to Nigeria and taught the biggest bank in Africa, um, taught a lot of their executives how to negotiate. And uh, so I'm finding there's a lot of demand from many different, many different uh, walks of life for negotiation. In fact, one of the more interesting ones was that I was asked by 30 psychiatrists working within the UK's National Health Service to teach them how to negotiate. So uh, it seems as if in walk all walks of life, uh, people recognize that uh, you can do it by the seat of your pants, but if you learn how to do it properly, you can get much better results for both sides. How does it work with high-level executives who may pride themselves on their ability to negotiate? Do they uh, tend to be receptive to this, this uh, workshop environment, or do they think they, they know it all? Every so often you get somebody who, who doesn't like the fact that they have to expose the fact that they, uh, that, that they you know, are not perfect at it. Um, and sometimes we have to unlearn certain habits. Um, I don't think he'd be upset if I mentioned that we had a very, very, very nice guy from Serbia where he had a very tough attitude of winner takes all. And his colleagues, um, and he was the CEO of a company, but his colleagues who were also on the program from all walks of life from different countries, um, they sort of started 
in a very friendly way teasing him about this. And by the end of the program, he stood up at the final dinner we had and, and talked about how it, had, how it had changed his approach. So I think that people do find that when they get away from the office, they can let their hair down a bit. And they do a lot of role plays and simulations where they're playing roles that are very different from what they do in normal life. And it's a great leveler. And it, work, it works pretty well. And one of the things you do especially well is simplify the language of, of negotiation and international interaction. Could you give us an example from your World Bank experience of, of how you were able to boil down a complex idea into something relatively simple that resonated everywhere? Well, that's right. I mean, the, the, the best example, I think, was that for a long time I've been trying to explain very complicated numbers that were you know, percentages of gross national product and converting those into um, uh, uh, cents of out of every hundred dollars worth of GDP because you can touch 15 cents but you can't touch 0.15 percent of a GDP. So trying to look at tangible ways of looking at things and it was actually back in 1990 the World Bank had brought out the World Development Report, an annual report from the World Bank that year, really pivotal report and amongst other things, amongst recommendations of how to reduce poverty in the developing world, the World Bank's economists had done an enormous amount of research to come up with a, how you can assess what level people are living in poverty. And so the figure they came up with was that uh, a per capita GDP of under $370 a year was how you could judge it. And we got the economists who'd done all the research sitting in the room with the president of the World Bank, the former congressman, Barbara Conable, and we were briefing him for a TV interview. And he kept on, there were lots of numbers he had to remember, and he kept on getting them wrong, which you can't blame him, there was just too much to remember. And I said, well, look, let's just take a time out. Let's look at this a bit differently. I said, instead of saying $370 a year per capita GDP, why don't you say people living on less than a dollar a day? 365 days in the year, let's just say a dollar a day. And everybody said, wow, that's a good idea. And then from then on, that team and everybody else and the president of the World Bank used the term a dollar a day. So I feel that was a classic case of simplification. And nowadays, all over the world, you hear people referring to any time there's a conversation about development assistance, helping developing countries, people talk about people living on less than a dollar a day. And it's kind of nice to know that that was an expression that I coined on that occasion in uh, in, in the summer of, uh, of, of, uh, of the year 2000, or the year of 1990, 1990. Now, tell us about the, the craft of negotiation as it has evolved in different parts of the world. The one at Oxford is now a signature program, but uh, wh where are some other places that negotiation is practiced at a very high level? Well, of course, um, in Boston, and specifically at Harvard, they have the program on negotiation, uh, at the law school at Harvard, but that brings in people from the Kennedy School, from the business school at Harvard, and from places like Tufts, MIT, and elsewhere. So that is a, a the sort of is really a sort of center of thinking on negotiation. They're very, very good there. In fact, one of the first negotiation courses I ever did was at Harvard, and they're very, very good at it. Um, and we we teach some of the same sorts of ideas, but we've brought in quite a lot of a lot of other concepts as well. Um, I think that. One of the fundamentals which modern thinking on negotiation very much applies is that you must put yourself in the other side's shoes. And you, you, too many people approach negotiations from the point of view that there's a certain amount of value on the table and everything you claim from that value on the table means that the other side loses it. And there was a lovely cartoon in the New Yorker of two dogs uh, dressed in nice suits sitting on a stool uh, at a bar in New York. And one dog is saying to the other dog, it's not only enough that me must win, cats must lose. Now, we, we subscribe to the view that if you're thinking the cats must lose, you're not going to be a very top dog yourself. And so we'd much prefer it if people take the attitude that the other side can also do well, and you will normally do better if you understand what the other side's needs are, you understand what their interests are, you understand what ultimately they would be willing to accept. And if you both go away from the table reasonably happy, but you obviously want yourself to be a bit happier, um, then you're going to get a good outcome. What is the mistake that somebody typically makes as he or she goes into a negotiation? Is it 
advancing a, a maximum position from which the person is unwilling to yield, or is it some kind of misconstrued expectation about the outcome? You, you just touched on this a little bit, but is there, is there a mistake that somebody would commonly make in these settings that, that you can address? Well, a couple of things I can mention. One is that um, uh, we, the two building blocks of negotiation that we focus on are decision-making and persuasion. In decision-making, people make mistakes all the time. Our DNA is geared to make us make mistakes. So we do teach people how to be aware of things that mistakes they make in decision-making and how the other side may manipulate you to make these mistakes. And one of the big things is anchoring. Um, you get a number out there to start with, and there tends to be the focus all around that. And people, the mistake people do is that they, they dwell on whatever the other side says, and they should move quickly on and say, well, let's actually step back and look at what we need out of this. And they put in a new number or a new policy idea, and the focus is around that. So that's, there are lots of these uh, decision-making biases that we address. The other thing is that the other building block is persuasion, and too often people who are smart, most of the people who we're dealing with are very smart, they make their arguments far too complicated and m too difficult. They don't recognize that, as Aristotle pointed out, the logos you've got to make simple, the ethos, which is the character of you as the messenger, must be credible and authoritative and likable, and that you must understand the pathos of who you're talking to and frame things in a way they understand. So those are things. But in terms of mistakes that they make in the actual negotiation strategy, often I think it's they make threats that they will not carry through on, and uh, they lose all credibility when they do that. The other mistake people often make is they think that because it's a negotiation and because when people bargain over a, uh, a, a trinket in a, in a bazaar somewhere uh, and they lie to the seller and the seller lies to them, that lying is okay in negotiation. And we argue that lying is not okay. And we teach quite a bit on ethics, we teach quite a bit on trust, and that once you start lying, it makes it very difficult to measure what both sides need to get out of it. And so I would also say that a big issue that people often don't do is they don't prepare well enough. Mm -hmm. um, they don't understand their own position well enough, and they usually are fall far short on what the other side may be able to do. Talk to us a bit about culture. Obviously, negotiating styles, strategies, and so forth differ from, from place to place and culture to culture. How have you gotten around that in producing your uh, techniques in a way that they can be used in different places? Well, it's funny. Um, one of the countries that I've visited quite a bit, I've actually taught negotiation in, in Shanghai, so I've visited China a lot. And um, the Chinese have a reputation of being quite tough negotiators, and they, um, uh, they, you know, a lot of people say, I don't want to negotiate with the Chinese. We can learn a lot from the way they do it. And it's funny you should mention this, because talking about gathering information, knowing what to, uh, the other side is doing, the Chinese are past masters at that. You go to China, and by the time you've had your third meal of duck's tongues, which are more chewy than you expect, and you've been taken to the summer palace several times, and you've got out of breath climbing up on the Great Wall, you think, when are we going to start negotiating? Now the Chinese are getting to know you. And during that time, you should be getting to know them. And we can learn a lot from that. They also have a thing called guangxi in China, which is the idea of a relationship and getting to know people really in many, many different ways. They're very good at doing that. So we can learn from the Chinese. Another country that, interestingly, we, well, we can learn lessons from the way they are. The person who teaches in our program in Oxford on cross-cultural negotiation, to which we devote a half day, is a guy called Michael Gates. He's tremendously good. He lives in Finland. And one of the things that happens in a negotiation is that people are often uncomfortable with silence. So if, if, there's, if there's a pause and there's an extended silence, people often jump into the void. And Michael tells a lovely story of when he was selling, uh, first moved to Finland, he was selling a package, a teaching package to somebody. And the uh, person he was dealing with, he said, he said to him, well, you can have it for 100,000 Finnmarks. The guy was silent. So then Michael said, well, maybe for you, 95, and then he went to, 90, and eventually, um, when he said 85, the man he was negotiating with said, OK. Months later, Michael had got to know him, was talking to him, and he said, Pekka, what, what was happening there? You're such a good negotiator. And um, now, the Finnish people 
are very silent people, um, and they, 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 they are not very communicative. And Pecker said, well, John, when you said 100,000, I thought to myself, hmm, very good price. And then while I was trying to remember whether it's, I'm very interested for your offer, at your offer, you went down in price. And before I just realized it was, I'm very interested in your offer, you'd come down even more. So I said, this is getting interesting. And when it got to 85, I felt sorry for you. So it was a good illustration of reacting to silence by not leaping into the void and bargaining yourself out of what you want to get. But how are you going to know those aspects of a culture unless you've studied them or, or you have access to someone who's familiar? Well, in fact, Michael, who teaches in our program in Oxford, and I've learned a certain amount from him. In fact, as part of my own development, I went to learn. Um, I did a course in, um, in cross-cultural um, communications so that I understand a lot of these things now. But in Michael's case, we, we, you know, he teaches away a lot of different national cultures work. And the, the key is, though, not to, not to fall into the danger of stereotyping people, but you can become much more effective as a negotiator if you realize that the somewhat bizarre behavior of people like the Finn who doesn't say anything or the Chinese person who takes you all over Beijing before you start talking is to do with their culture. It's not that they're nasty people or difficult people or boring people. And so you can be more tolerant of these changes and you just simply understand better the way people are the way they are. I've done a lot of teaching in India. The first time I taught in India, I was so depressed because everybody in the class seemed to be disagreeing with me because everything I said, they went like this. Now, that's the equivalent in the West of going like this. Indian people move their heads back from side to side when they're in agreement with you. Um, now, if you understand something like that, and it's just one of a hundred examples, you can actually be much better understanding of what the other side is looking for. And it's always about what the other side needs. And the key thing out of a negotiation is to bring as many issues to the table as possible. You've got, say, a dozen issues you've got on the table. Examine each issue and determine the value to each side of each issue because a lot of those issues, same item, will be of different value to one side than the other. And what you're looking for is where it, one item is of high value for one side to gain and of low cost to the other side to concede. Every time you've got one of those, you've got a potential deal. And when you've got several of those, you make package deals, and that's how you get your breakthroughs. But I don't want to tell you too much because people won't want to come on the programs unless they, <laughs> if they know all the tricks. <laughs> exactly. Tell us about an environment that you have gone into either to negotiate or to teach negotiation in which you felt frustrated <laughs> because it was so different from, from what you had experienced before. Yes, I mean, I think probably the best example I can give is I was asked by the United Nations to go to Pyongyang, North Korea, uh, to teach the UN teams in North Korea how to negotiate. And when I got there, uh, they said, oh, by the way, Tim, uh, we've decided to include our local North Korean staff on the, uh, in the program. So half the people on the program are people from France and Italy and uh, Switzerland and Bangladesh and Kazakhstan, and half of them are from North Korea. And these are people who have three jobs. One is they have their official UN job. Two, they are the eyes and ears, or call it what you like, of the North Korean government. And three, they're the people that are the minders taking people around from abroad because you're not allowed to go anywhere on your own in North Korea. And that was very worrisome. North Korean are pretty tough negotiators and pretty, pretty unforgiving. But actually, after um, uh, a couple of days with them at a resort outside Pyongyang, they do have resorts in North Korea, um, these people were laughing and they were getting into roles. And uh, there was one scary moment, though, because there's one simulation I teach uh, where part of the scenario refers to an article or to, refers to something that happened in Seoul, South Korea. And um, uh, you don't talk about Seoul and South Korea when you're in North Korea. So at the last minute, I was glancing over this before teaching it. Oh, oh my God. And I changed it to Bangkok, Thailand, just in the nick of time, because that could have got me deported, probably. <laughs> You've talked about teaching negotiation. There's an opportunity coming up in Central Florida for exactly that. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, um, I'm very excited. It's the third time I've been here. Um, I'm teaching a two-day um, 
session at the Executive Development Center downtown Orlando uh, for the University of Central Florida. And uh, this will, is very much hoping that uh, a good number of people from lots of different professions in uh, Central Florida will be able to come to this. And it's going to be uh, at the beginning of uh, April, uh, 10th and 11th of April. And um, uh, we'll be doing a lot of the sort of techniques that I teach will be, uh, will be shared with people here. And they'll get an opportunity to play some roles which are going to teach them how to negotiate better. And, uh, and uh, I think they'll have a lot of fun, but they, I hope, will end up being better negotiators. I'm wondering what, what might the typical participant expect uh, when he or she comes uh, to this workshop, just as an example, maybe on, on the first day? Uh, well, um, we will start off by, uh, I do some broad uh, general introductions to negotiation, which are a lot of really underlying themes that um, that they must understand about how to negotiate. And then we go into the building blocks of decision making and persuasion. And in the course of that, we're a few games we play, a few things where people get lured into making bad decisions, start to see, do some self-examination of how they can do things better. And then we go into um, some simulations and they'll be doing some quite interesting things. They'll be, uh, well, they may play the role of a, uh, somebody who owns a tractor company who's trying to, uh, um, get involved in a joint venture with a Chinese tractor company, so that brings in some quite tough negotiating issues uh, of a merger and acquisition, but it also has cross-cultural issues. Uh, they'll uh, learn from uh, um, uh, a true story of uh, trying to sell a house and a lot of negotiation things that happen there. So these will be things that they can relate to fairly easily, but they'll be different from what they do in their normal lives. And uh, so for two days, we'll take them through increasingly uh, complex negotiations and the grand finale uh, on the uh, second afternoon is a, a very complicated negotiation where they're negotiating in six teams of two people and they're from uh, they're, they're from very different uh, backgrounds and so on and uh, people do often negotiate in teams and most negotiation programs you might go to, on to places are always individuals negotiating and I think people do need to figure out how they negotiate in, in pairs and in teams, and so we, we do that towards the end. We often hear from lawyers and other professionals, people in the business community who are interested in this uh, executive education, but it really is broader than that. This, this is education that could benefit people from multiple walks of life. Absolutely, and I think that one of the things that really gets to me is when they call it training. Um, there's nothing wrong with training, but this is not typical training. This is transformative. It's really changing the way people think about doing things and um, and certainly from all walks of life certainly and uh, and uh, we uh, uh, you know I, I always say that one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was allowing both of my children when they're in graduate school uh, to come as interns on the program we run in Oxford because my wife has never forgiven me because they negotiate much better than we do now so whatever walk of life you are in you can um, uh, you can benefit from this thank you for joining us today mr. Colin Thank you. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF.